Hi there, welcome to the Cory Doctorow podcast. Well, it's kind of an odd day. Uh, I turned up this morning, Monday morning, at my office in central London, which is in a, it's an old Victorian factory that's been cut up into a lot of uh, very cheap rooms. Uh, I think it's the cheapest uh, real estate in central London for, for rental and, uh, you know, totally suits my needs. But there were cops all over the place. Literally every door had a bobby with a big hat on. And uh, it turns out that there is a fatal fire upstairs over the weekend. I, I know that there are a few people who actually live here illegally. Uh, and apparently someone died on the second floor. My office is on the ground floor. And um, in British numbering, that's actually the second floor would be what we would call the third floor in North America. So it's two stories up. Uh, and there's no sign of any kind of damage around my office or anywhere on my floor. So it doesn't directly affect me, except that it's, you know, obviously very disturbing. And... Um, uh, I can't go check my mail because there's police everywhere. Anyway, it's uh, kind of a strange day. Sorry if I sound a little quirky as a result. Uh, last night, uh, a reader forwarded me a, uh, a leaked uh, document that purported to be the internet enforcement chapter from the secret anti-counterfeiting trade agreement. This is the, the secret copyright treaty that the U.S. and some of its major partners have been negotiating for uh, a couple of years now. Uh, no one will release the text of this treaty because they, they claim it's national security. This is utterly unprecedented. Copyright treaties are generally made in public and full sight of people like me and uh, non-governmental organizations and the press and critics and so on. Um, and in the Obama memo on why they're doing this in secret, they basically said that that's why, that, that when they do this around activists and the public and the press, they don't get what they want. And so they're, they're doing this in secret this time around. So so um, this is, if it's real, and it looks real to me, it's the first time it's ever been published. Michael Geist has done some initial analysis on it. I took a stab at it last night, um, and I think we'll see lots more of analysis of this as well. Um, one thing that's pretty clear, if this is genuine, is that the U.S. Trade Representative has been lying to Americans because the USTR has said that... Uh, ACTA does not include what's called three strikes, which is the idea that you and your whole family would be disconnected from the internet if you were accused, but not even convicted of um, infringing activity on your network connection. Um, and it's pretty clear that it does include this, and this is supposedly the U.S. draft. So not only does it include it, but it includes it at the behest of the U.S. Trade Representative. So um, if I were you, I'd be pretty pissed off about this. Uh, I certainly am. Um, hello to everybody I saw last week at The Story, which is the, uh, the conference here in, in London about stories and storytelling. Uh, for those of you who couldn't make it, I read aloud the story uh, called um, The Right Book, uh, which Neil Gaiman also read aloud at the World Science Fiction Convention, which is going to be in my next short story collection with a little help. So um, uh, I'm sure they'll have audio and so on up for that. And if they do, I'll pop it in the podcast feed. And in the meantime, if you want to hear what Neil Gaiman sounds like reading it, it's up on the Internet Archive. Uh, I'm going to be doing another public talk here in London on March the 2nd. I'll be at the at Ignite this year uh, at 7 p.m. on March the 2nd. It's somewhere down in the southwest part of London, Knightsbridge, I think. Uh, if you Google Ignite Dr. O London, it should turn up. And if you're in London, I hope I'll see you. And right around then, I'm going to be taking the uh, Life in the UK citizenship test. Uh, I'm not actually going to become a British citizen yet, but I will, with any luck, become a permanent resident. And to do that, I have to take this test that includes things like what year women got the right to vote at 30 and what year they got the right to vote at 21 and how many people there are in Northern Ireland and how big the Northern Irish Assembly is, even though it's been suspended and so on. So it's, uh, it's, this is, it's weird. It's like studying in high school again, a bunch of meaningless facts and things that I, I think are actually not particularly true, like true or false, um, hard drug use always leads to insanity, uh, <laughs> which I just don't think is true. And, and I think actually the, the drug czar, uh, the British drug czar, who was forced to resign because he said he didn't think it was true, didn't think it was true either. So it's it's a fairly politicized test, but I'm going to shut up, take the test, pass it. The big, t the big question for me is whether I'll actually go for citizenship. I think I will, uh, even though it means swearing allegiance to the Queen, which I'm not particularly excited about, as I don't know that I feel any allegiance to the Queen. I'm, a, I'm pretty much a Republican uh, in that sense, not the, uh, not the American political sense, of course. Um, 
And the other uh, bit of uh, public speaking news for you is that I've confirmed that I'm going to Melbourne, Australia for the World Science Fiction Convention uh, in early September, and I'll be also at the same time speaking at the Melbourne Writers' Festival and some other events. So uh, I'll be doing a workshop, I think, and some other stuff. So I hope I'll see you either at the Worldcon or at the Melbourne Writers' Festival, or possibly at both if you are an Australian and live anywhere near there. All right, well, that's enough uh, news. Let's let's cut over to a little more from Clockwork Fagan, this steampunk young adult story that I wrote for Kelly Link and Gavin Grant's young adult steampunk anthology from Candlewick Press. I mentioned last week that it hadn't been approved yet. Um, I have now had it approved. I made some minor edits, nothing very major. Um, and so this, as far as I can tell, is going to be what the story will look like when it's in print. And here's a little more of it. Here's the oath we swore to Monty before we went to work on the automaton. I, state your full name, do hereby give my most solemn oath that I will never ever betray the secrets of St. Agatha's. I bind myself to the good fortunes of my fellow inmates at this institution and vow to honor them as though they were my brothers and sisters, and not to fight with them, nor spite them, nor do them down or dirty. I make this oath freely and gladly, and should I betray it, I wish that old Satan himself would rise up from the pit and tear out my treacherous guts and use them for bootlaces, that his devils would tear my betrayer's tongue from my mouth and use it to wipe their private parts, that my lying body would be fed inch by inch to the hungry and terrible basilisks of the pit, so I swear, and so mode be it. There were two children who'd worked for a tanner in the house, older children. Matthew was shy all the fingers on his left hand. Becca was missing an eye in her nose, which she joked was a mercy, for there is no smell more terrible than the charnel reek of the tanning works. But between them, they were quite certain that they could carefully remove, stuff, and remount Grinder's head, careful to leave the jaw in place. As the oldest machinist at St. Aggie's, I was conscripted to work on the torso and armature mechanisms. I play chief engineer, bossing a gang of six boys and four girls who had experience with mechanisms. We cannibalized St. Aggie's old mechanical wash wringer with its spindly arms and many fingers. I was sent out several times to pawn Grinder's fine crystal and pocket watch to raise money for parts. Monty oversaw all, but he took personal charge of Grinder's voice box, through which he would imitate old Grinder's voice when the sisters came by on Sunday. St. Aggie's was fronted with a Dutch door, and Grinder habitually only opened the top half to jaw with the sisters. Monty said that we could prop the partial torso on a low table, to hide the fact that no legs depended from it. We'll tie a sick kerchief around his face and give out that he's got the flu, and that it spread through the whole house. That'll get us all out of church, which is a tidy little jackpot in and of itself. The kerchief will disguise the fact that his lips ain't moving in time with his talking. I shook my head at this idea. The nuns were hardly geniuses, but how long could this hold out for? It won't have to last more than a week. By next week, we'll have something better to show him. Here's a thing. It all worked like a fine-tuned machine. The kerchief made it look like a bank robber, and Monty painted its face to make him seem more lively, for the tanning had dried him out some. He also doused the horrible thing with liberal lashings of bay rum, and greased its hair with a heavy pomade, for the tanning process had left him with a smell like an outhouse on a hot day. Monty had affixed an armature to the thing's bottom jaw. We'd had to break it to get it open, prying it roughly with a screwdriver, cracking a tooth or two in the process, and I have nightmares to this day about the sound it made when it finally yawed open. A child, little legless Dora, whose begging pitch included a sad little puppetry show, could work this armature by means of a squeeze bulb taken from the siphon starter on Grinder's cider brewing tub, and so made the jaw go up and down in time with speech. The speech itself was accomplished by means of the horse gut voice box from Grinder's music box. Monty sure handedly affixed a long, smooth glass tube, part of the cracking apparatus I had been sent to the market to buy, to the music box's resonator. This he ran up behind our automatic grinder, then crouched on the floor before the voice box, stationed next to Dora on her wheeled plank, he was able to whisper across the horse gut strings and have them buzz out a credible version of Grinder's whiskey rough and growl. And once he tuned the horse gut just so, the vocal resemblance was even more remarkable. Combined with Dora's skillful puppetry, the effect was galvanizing. It took a conscious effort to remember that this was a puppet talking to you, not a man. The sisters turned up at the appointed hour on Sunday, only to be greeted by our clockwork grinder, stood in the half-door, face swathed in a flue mask. 
We'd hung quarantine bunting from the windows, crisscrossing the front of St. Aggie's with it for good measure, and a goodly number of us kiddies were watching from the upstairs windows with our best drawn and sickly looks on our faces. So the sisters hung back practically at the pavement and shouted, Mr. Grindersworth, in alarmed tones, staring with horror at the apparition in the doorway. Sisters, good day to you, Monty said into his horse gut, while Dora worked her squeeze bulb and the jaw went up and down behind its white cloth, and the muffled simulation of Grinder's voice emanated from the top of the glass tube, hidden behind the automaton's head, so that it seemed to come from the right place. Though not such a good day for us, I fear. The children are ill? Monty gave it a fine sham of Grinder's laugh, the one he used when dealing with proper people, with the cruelty barely plastered over. (laughs) Oh, not all of them, but we have a dozen cases. Thankfully, I appear to be immune. And oh my, but you wouldn't believe the help these tots are in the practical nursing department. Fine kitties, my charges. Yes, indeed. But still, best to keep them away from the general public for the nonce, hey? I'm quite sure that we'll have them up on their feet by next Sunday, and they'll be glad indeed of the chance to get down on their knees and thank the beneficent Lord for their good health. Monty was laying it on thick, but then, so had Grinder when it came to the sisters. "'We shall send over some help after the services,' the head sister said, hands at her breast, a tear glistening in her eye at the thought of our bravery. I thought the jig was up. Of course the order would have some sisters who'd had the flu and gotten over it, rendering them immune. But Monty never worried. "'No, no,' he said smoothly. I had the presence of mind to make the cranks that operated the arms we constructed for him, waving them about in a negating way. This effect was rather spoiled by my nervousness, so that they seemed more octopus tentacle than arm, but the sisters didn't appear to notice. As I say, we have plenty of help here with my good children. A basket, then, the sister said. Some nourishing food and fizzy drinks for the children. Crouching low in the anteroom, we crippled children traded disbelieving looks with one another. Not only had Monty gotten rid of Grinder and gotten us out of going to church, but he'd also set things up so that the sisters of St. Aggie's were going to bring us their best grub for free because we were all so poorly and ailing. It was all we could do not to cheer. And cheer we did later when the sisters set ten huge hampers down on our doorstep whence we retrieved them, finding in them a feast fit for princes. Cold meat pies glistening with aspic, marrow bones still warm from the oven, suet puddings and jugs of custard with skin on top of them, huge bottles of fizzy lemonade and small beer. By the time we laid it out in the dining room, it seemed like we'd never be able to eat it all. But we ate every last morsel, and four of us carried Monty about on our shoulders, two carrying, two steadying the carriers, and someone found a concertina, and someone found some combs and wax paper, and we all sang until the walls shook, the mechanics folly, a combinatorial explosion at the computer works, and endless rounds of For He's a Jolly Good Fellow. Monty had promised improvements on the clockwork grinder by the following Sunday, and he made good on it. Since we no longer had to beg all day, we children of St. Aggie's had time in plenty, and Monty had no shortage of skilled volunteers who wanted to work with him on the Grinder 2, as he called it. Grinder 2 sported a rather handsome and large droopy mustache, which hid the action of its lips. This mustache was glued onto the head assembly one hair at a time, a painstaking job that denuded every horsehair brush in the house, but the effect was impressive. More impressive was the leg assembly I bossed into existence, a pair of clockwork pins that could lever Grinder from a seated position into full upright, balancing him by means of three gyros we hid in his chest cavity. Once these were wound and spun, Grinder could stand up in a very natural fashion. Once we'd rearranged the furniture to hide Dora and Monty behind a large armchair, you could stand right in the parlor and converse with him, and unless you were looking very hard, you'd never know but what you were talking with a mortal man, and not an automaton made of tanned flesh, steel, springs, and clay. We'd used rather a lot of custom-made porcelain from the prosthetics works to get his legs right. The children who were shy a leg or two knew which leg makers in town had the best wares. And so when the sisters arrived the following Sunday, they were led right into the parlor whose net curtains kept the room in a semi-dark state, and there they parlayed with Grinder, who came to his feet when they entered and left. One of the girls was in charge of his arms, and she had practiced with them so well that she was able to move them in a very convincing fashion. Convincing enough, any road. The sisters left Grinder with a bag of clothes, a bag of oranges that had come off a ship that sailed from Spanish Florida right up the St. Lawrence to the port of Montreal, and thereafter traversed by rail car to Muddy York. 
they made a parcel gift of these succulent treasures to Grinder to help the kitties keep away the scurvy, but Grinders always kept them for himself or flogged them to his pals for a neat penny. We wolfed the oranges right after services and then took our Sabbath free with games and more brandy from Grinder's sideboard. You've been listening to the Cory Doctor Podcast, licensed under Creative Commons Attribution, non commercial, share alike US 3.0. Or as Woody Guthrie put it in another context, this song is copyrighted in the US under seal of copyright 154085 for a period of 28 years, and anyone caught singing it without our permission will be a mighty good friend of ours, because we don't give a dern. Publish it, write it, sing it, swing to it, yodel it, we wrote it, that's all we wanted to do. Many thanks to John Taylor Williams for mastering. That's Rynex Studio, W-R-Y-N-E-C-K Studio at gmail.com. John Taylor Williams is a full-time self-employed audio engineer, producer, composer, and sound designer. In his free time, he makes beer, jewelry, odd musical instruments, and furniture. He likes to meditate, to read, and to cook. Talk to you next week.